everyone. So hi, my name is Marinella. I will be speaking about theory and practice and activism. Um, I do understand what you're asking me, but if we need to put it into some kind of brackets within the, the Balkans, um, we need to think about and speak about the war and everything that we have after it. Um, not in terms of, um, I don't know, like new generations who are trying, I mean new, what does that even mean? Um, who are trying to overcome all of those barriers. Um, but I think that in individualism in the Balkans does cost, cost us the movement. I feel like it's quite hard to build a movement um, in the, on, on these grounds. And in terms of theory, there is this issue. Actually, during, during the morning session, I was listening um, and I wrote a number of questions and notions. I feel like there is this um, strong, like, there is this lack of intergenerational knowledge share, like we are not sharing it. So what we have now is the feminist history. If we go just up until 1991, not before that, if we are just counting like since there is Croatia, we have feminist activism and we have feminist theory. And we also have this like huge blind spot where things do overlap, but we do not name those, those situations. And that is the issue here. I think that we are lacking words and idioms to name uh, elements of the movement that could work on our behalf. And that's why I see this issue as an as a problem that stems from the privatization that, that occurred and is still happening from the fact that we um, kind of closed ourselves into our little nationalistic boxes. And although there is this need and will to, to go beyond that, it's not happening. And in terms of um, global movement, from my experience, um, I am a part of different initiatives, but sometimes there is this issue of knowing our own past, our own struggles, um, our dependency or on colonialism and on imperialism, and how everything that our land has been through reflects on us. And because of that, activists too often just uh, build ideas about certain parts of the world or regions and stop with the process of building bridges. Thank you. Thank you, Marinella. Manuel, I can, I can jump in because here we are having several uh, generations of uh, uh, feminists, uh, uh, activists, theoricians, uh, we have Rada, we have Nadezhda, we have Adriana, we have a, a lot of us uh, are here and we are not belonging to the same generation. I don't know even uh, Nadezhda and Rada, I, I'm not sure, sure, but then still. And my, what is Marinella saying? And then she's the youngest, if I may say so, and the toughest. Which is to say, you you have a nerve to uh, to to call upon all this, and so please go on, Marinella, and and uh, do your fight here with us. We we are with you. Mm, yeah. So thank you, thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, when it comes to this transgenerational transfer of knowledge, um, I. I'm not sure that we can like put a finger on on the one who's guilty. I think it's our mutual issue as each and every one of us is just trying to navigate their own spaces uh, within certain political contexts, et cetera, et cetera. But um, 
I would just like for uh, Manuel to tell to tell me <laughs> when is it all right for me to start with my text. <laughs> Thank you. But, but please, please start because I, I think that it's a, a trigger to 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 ask uh, later if, if you want. Okay, sure. So um, as I said, uh, my name is Marinella. I work in uh, Pariter, which is a uh, Rijeka-based uh, feminist organization. And I'm the women's rights and reproductive justice program lead. I will be speaking about expanding the field of practical translation from the domain of activism to theory and vice versa, mostly through the lens of my own experiences, experiences of the organization that I'm working in, and the movement that we are hoping that we are building including the catchphrase, nothing about us without us. Um, so this organization, Pariter, which means equal, was founded in 2014. And since its inception, it was oriented towards activism and in a way, knowledge production. In the beginning, there was only one person, so everything went quite slowly, but one of the first activities that were organized were one billion rising events, human libraries, exhibitions like women in um, science or exhibitions on abortion and similar. And then after the team uh, expanded in 2016 and new and amazing people came to our collective energy and ideas, created new moments in the organizational uh, reality. Um, when it comes to this issue of translation of activism to theory and vice versa, I would like to expand that space and say that I am interested in permanent interactive translation from one to the other, connections based on the aha moment, uh, fortunately or unfortunately. It's hard for any activist, let alone a feminist activist, to be continuously immersed in one kind of activity. Surely, if we are speaking about a feminist activist who might be, I don't know, a social worker who delivers services, the realities are different. But for most of us, we do protests, we do advocacy, we do media outreach, uh, we do, I don't know, um, we conduct research, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a lot of things going on at the same uh, time. But if we are speaking about a feminist, uh, activist whose main purpose is to highlight issues that stem from gender oppression, then things are quite different. Um, we just have to be continuously immersed in, immersed in the field of practical and theoretical, and that process is just the process of lifelong education. As Lord said, for the master's tool will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game but they will never, never enable us to bring about genuine change. And this fact is only threatening to those women who still define the master's house as their only source of support. Of course, Lordi comes from a different background and life experiences. However, these wise words can give us a general glance at the feminist struggles within one country. We cannot de deconstruct our narratives without reshaping and reframing them. But then again, if we speak about just the language and the translation, of course, we need to know the language. And somehow it seems to me that quite some time and too often, just this fact that creation is extremely gendered in terms of grammar, we tend to lose our own momentum. So we are trying to translate activism, theory, advocacy, practice, everything that's happening while using quite masculinized language. And that is an issue that needs to be addressed and of course, resolved. Uh, in the context of the aforementioned translation an aha moment of realization is necessary. It's a kind of a dance between two oppositions at the border between the theoretical and the practical, the acquisition of theoretical and practical knowledge, as well as their mutual overflow and integration is inherently feminist. Theory must be anchored in practice and practice must be anchored in theory. If that's not the case, what are we actually talking about? However, 
The fact is that feminist theory is too often marginalized and dispersed, and it's quite a challenge to obtain feminist education within this country, within Croatia. Therefore, how do we learn? From who do we learn? Which resources are credible? How should one navigate feminist theories by herself or himself? Everything ends up with, with us, women who are interested in the subject, to learn and read and hope that the materials that we face are in fact credible. Another thing is the fact that the anti-gender movement is not on the rise, but rampages through our culture and lives, and that it's extremely demanding to navigate that stolen human rights discourse if one is not brave and or educated enough. With that in mind, everything that is left for a person who does not have the means, time, or energy, because higher education is a privilege, is to navigate the learning process with some help from her or his peers. Just a second. Other feminist activists and feminist organizations, how we acquire theoretical knowledge and how do we acquire practical knowledge as the context is contingent and not fixed because we do not have continuous education, as I said. Um, then again, we need to have the room to maneuver to manage this phenomenon. And that's why we need the knowledge and theory needs practical knowledge because it cannot innovate on its own. And the experience of collaboration on structured education in framing and reframing is extremely important for everyone involved as is the question of understanding discursive practices and understanding social practices, how people identify with values through language and media, and how aha moments help us understand the community that we are a part of. Learning is not always a structured process, and therefore it's a lifelong experience. Uh, with that being said, uh, my organization is implementing um, this subject at the University of Rijeka designed as a community-based course where students attend lectures at the faculty after which they come to our and our partners' organizations and learn in situ how a civil society organization operates. In terms of translation, that would be the most obvious example of translation from theory to practice that happens. However, the translation is inherent in the multidisciplinary work that the organization organizations do. Uh, we collaborate with the Center for Women's Studies at the university. Uh, we collaborate with lesbian organization Lodi and SOS ELECA. So to get more practical, I would like to go through a couple of projects that we are implementing or have implemented. One of them was the public campaign Women in Public Spaces. It was an action that started in the summer of 2020 as a result of a couple of older men who were saying disgusting things to a colleague and a friend. We started a Twitter hashtag, which went trending in a matter of days, and the whole region started talking about sexual harassment in public spaces. We gave numerous media statements, built a web page on sexual harassment in public spaces in the following months, lay the foundation on that topic within the public sphere. Literally, we have translated our own experiences into activist material and mobilized thousands of women to share their stories. And the issue was the burning issue within the media discourse for a while. Sexual harassment in public spaces is a feminist topic that combines both a public and a private and a right to authenticity and security in a certain situation. It was of utmost importance to open the subject and tell it how it is, and it's not pretty. Furthermore, as I mentioned before, we are implementing uh, human libraries, which is a concept that puts um, people who come from marginalized communities in the role of a book, and then pupils or people from the outside citizens come and speak with them. And that is an amazing concept. And we, we we have been implementing for like the last five years. And what we are doing through the human libraries, is especially when we are conducting workshops for the students before, before the, the sole activity, is that we teach them about discrimination from a theoretical perspective and then give them an opportunity to deconstruct their own prejudice during a discussion with a member of an oppressed group. Uh, furthermore, we are part of the Reproductive Justice Platform, who works on multiple issues that stem from the Reproductive Justice uh, Framework. 
However, I was, I'm constantly thinking about how do we reach marginalized communities? Um, how do we overcome that issue of tokenization of people of different backgrounds? And when it comes to that catchphrase, nothing about us without us, I feel like the movement is built of uh, women, LGBTIQ uh, community members of et cetera, who are facing some kind of discrimination. But also I feel like there is a barrier for people of different uh, backgrounds in terms of nation, nationalities or of different races or other minority communities who are not collaborating with us. And I feel like that is a huge issue and I cannot pinpoint why, why it is as it is, but it's not good. So um, I was speaking about grammar before and yeah, what I was, what I wanted to say actually is that as translation is political and personal is political and we are trying to reach the margins, but we are not unfortunately reaching them in the scope, which would be of any benefit. And this tokenism within the feminist movement is not something that is so much happening within our own community, but when we speak about transnational or global movement, we are very much aware that those things are happening and that somehow when someone some when like they put a person of color on a panel in that case like everything's fine there is no racism yeah there is racism and you are being one for playing um like that and what i wanted to say one more thing is about the narrative so the situation at the moment is that the neoconservatives have taken over the human rights discourse and they are just using the terms which we are used used on uh, using, and people finally started understanding them. But now, if they are being co-opted by, let's say, the other side, then we have an issue. And how can we fight that situation? Is to set the narrative as uh, the organization that I'm working with managed to do through this uh, survey on period poverty. And actually there was this whole new narrative set up within the, within the government and within the public discourse. Um, the, the tax was lower, but like the neoconservatives did, did not attack that issue because it's a matter, it's an issue related to poverty. So people kind of understood what was happening. However, when we are speaking about um, changing the narrative, then things are a bit more complicated, not changing, but reframing. For instance, one of the best uh, examples for that is the right to abortion, as we like to say, like, yeah, every woman has a right to, 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 to choose. Then the neoconservative groups and say, uh, come and say, yeah, Everyone has a right to life, to life, to live. And then what to do about that? Um, our idea is that abortion is just healthcare. And if we want to speak about abortion, we can also say that healthcare, that abortion is, or we can just use healthcare that respects women's right to choose. Um, and it's not an issue if we do not use the word abortion as such. In activism, sometimes it's necessary to adjust the narrative to the wider audience. And as I said, menstrual poverty was also a good example. And in terms of communication with the wider audience, uh, the sole survey was done to include also cis women um, and non-binary and trans people who, who have menstruation, but during this communication within the broader frame, within the community or with the media, we were quite often using just uh, women. Uh, not because we were trying to throw anyone under the train, but to highlight the fact that poverty is a gender, gendered issue. 
Um, currently, in terms of language practice, translation and theory, reframing the existing narrative is what's being done. As our hands are tied, the funding for feminist organizations on a global level is under 1%, 0.3 to be exact. Um, in order to reframe, it's necessary to familiarize ourselves with the main narrative and the theory that supports feminist efforts. Only in that case, we are privileged to perform that dance and to change the lives of ourselves and the people around us for the better. So um, to me, it seems like there is a lot of work that needs to be done. A lot of work has been done. And we need systematic, we need to systemize the knowledge that exists. And in that case, we can shorten the path when one starts being interested in feminist theory and feminist activism until one gets educated enough to um, produce something herself. Uh, in my case, that, that, that road was quite long. Um, and it really doesn't have to be like that. But as I said, like higher education is a privilege, but also uh, speaking about period poverty in a situation where women are being killed on a monthly basis. And there is this huge uh, disparity in homeowners when it comes to women and men. When we are discussing the fact that um, huge percentage of women are attending higher education but are not having top positions within different organizations, uh, we need to set like, our priorities straight and we need to make sure that more of us have the opportunity to, to work on these issue, issues. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs>